the song I know it well A melody that's never failed On mountains high, in valleys low My soul will rest my confidence in you alone Hope has a name, his name is Jesus My Savior's cross has set the sinner free Hope has a name, his name is Jesus O Christ be praised, I have victory There is a light, salvation's plain. Christ undefeated, trampled the grave. See now the cross, be lifted high. The light has come, the light has won. Well, good morning to you all. It's good to see you. And uh, for those of you that are joining us uh, online, we welcome you as well. Uh, we want to begin our service this morning with a scripture reading from Psalm 33. Uh, the scripture says this, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true, and he is faithful in all that he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his unfailing love. Can I get an amen on that this morning? The, Lord is, the, Lord, the earth is filled with the Lord's unfailing love. Aren't you thankful for that? I know Pastor had a good message this morning, uh, and I'm, I'm looking, to hear the, uh, look at the, looking forward to hearing it again. Um, uh, in our great pastors. As you can see, uh, we are getting uh, ready here for our Vacation Bible School. 
Uh, we got a little, uh, you know, volcano, you know, right here, uh, which we're uh, not behind you there. Right here, Jonathan. It's right there. Uh, okay. Uh, we're looking at a little volcano right here. We're hoping that that thing's going to, like, you know, belch some smoke, you mean, a little bit later on, and maybe some lava, you mean, during vacation Bible school, a little dock over here. Got a little, uh, you know, dilapidated, rundown lighthouse, and a little uh, cardboard hut over here. You know, we're... It's amazing the talented people that we have. We have a mural back there. Uh, you know, Michelle Renninger uh, got a chance to, uh, to to draw that out for us, and then uh, some of the kids painted it. You know, got so many talented people that come together to make these things happen. So, uh, would you pray for us this week, uh, and for the teachers that are here? You I mean as we have a chance to uh, uh, to conduct our Bible school, Big Fish Bay. Uh, is the name of it, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, remember uh, as well that uh, there is no evening service tonight because of a setup for VBS, uh, but all uh, services and midweek uh, things will resume as normal uh, the, follow- the the week after. Uh, also, a couple of announcements for the uh, uh, Genesis Women's Clinic. Uh, they're in, in need of some things, uh, some size 4 diapers, uh, some wipes, and some sippy cups. So if uh, any of those things are things that uh, you feel like you would be able to donate to them or, or purchase for them, uh, there is a box in the foyer uh, there in the church. So remember that, that that's what that box is for, to help out uh, the ministry there as they minister to, uh, to women in crisis. Uh, and um, also, our, our last one here for you is a reminder that the, the Ladies' Spiritual Gift Seminar, uh, July 28th and August 4th, uh, two separate dates there, and also two separate times uh, on those days uh, for you to be able to participate, uh, 9.30 to 11 a.m. Uh, and 7 to 8.30 p.m. There will be child care available, and also there will be live streaming, so hopefully you'll be able to join them uh, I mean, on uh, one of those events. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to Nick uh, for us to, uh, to sing and to shout joyfully to the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity, the right, the privilege to worship you. And not just worship you with our voices singing whatever songs we think are our favorite ones. But rather with gladness and with our lives, knowing that worship is letting our minds being transformed by you, giving our whole bodies as an act of service, following you wherever you tell us to go, knowing that you are right there with us. You're a good God who never leaves us nor forsakes us, but instead blesses us from heaven with every spiritual blessing. We thank you for the church body that we can grow together and learn to love you and each other deeper and deeper as you continue to grow us in your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Hallelujah, sing to Jesus, is the scepter, is the throne. Hallelujah, gives the triumph, is the victory alone. Hark the songs of peaceful Zion, thunder like the mighty flood. Jesus, out of every nation, hath redeemed us by his blood. Hallelujah, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Hallelujah, he is near us, faith believes, no question. Though the cloud from sight received him when the forty days were o'er, shall our hearts forgive his promise? I am with you evermore. Let's 
This is the song we've been learning all, all this month together. I think you should feel confident enough to sing out loud as we declare that his mercy is more than all of our sins combined. He will always forgive us. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their song. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the blindest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. Continue to stand, but you may be seated if needed. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. Heir of salvation, virtues of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior. Perfect sunbeam. 
watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my soul. for you from Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake. I'm going to mess it up again, Jay's Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the nets so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John Sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him.
Thank you for giving us this church, this body, and of course the, the immediate assembly that we get to attend, but the universal church that we can unite with believers across the globe and across time, for we all have the same Savior. There's only one. There was only one sacrifice on a cross that was sufficient for the sins of all mankind. That was the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danek and the uh, worship group. Are you rejoicing this morning? Absolutely. Oh, before I begin, I do want to note that the flowers up front here are in memory of Missy Nash Kramer. We had her uh, funeral services here uh, yesterday. Uh, she's with the Lord uh, right now, even as we speak. And so uh, she's in the land of the living, right? And uh, you're stuck here with me in the land of the dying. So... Uh, but, but we're going to preach, aren't we? We're going to preach the word. Uh, it's very appropriate, I think, that we have the stuff up here for the kids. Uh, Big Stink Bay, I think it's called. Something like that. I know whenever I get close to the shore and I smell that smell, it's enough to make me sick. Uh, because I am from a long line of land lovers. And uh, uh, the ocean, I, I never saw the ocean until I was about 12 years old. Lived here all my life. It's not that far away, is it? That's how deprived we were as children. Uh, my dad didn't take us anywhere. I think he was embarrassed by us. Uh, and so he made us stay home and uh, host strawberries and pick corn and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so uh, I went to the, didn't see the ocean until I was 12. And the first time I went out on the boat, uh, it was in my early 20s. It was my wife's fault because my father-in-law liked to fish. And uh, we got married. And then she said, you got to go with your father-in-law fishing. And uh, I threw up before we left the dock. <laughs> True story. I said, oh, you like the gentle rocking of the boat. <laughs> we didn't even get away from the pier, and I was going over the edge, you know. People were like, listen to this guy. Is he drunk or something? Uh, but uh, uh, fishing, uh, I don't know anything about in the ocean. Uh, I only have one fishing uh, passion, which I had from all of my life, and that was uh, fishing for trout, and uh, there you can just put on hip boots and stay on gra ground the whole time you're doing it. So uh, I was able to do that. However, at my house, uh, there is a lot of enjoyment with some shows about, some uh, reality shows. You like reality shows? Uh, my wife likes Deadliest Catch. I mean, if you feel like Deadliest Catch, you know, where they go out in the ocean and they're fishing for crabs and stuff like that in the Bering Sea. I watched that for two minutes. I'm like, no, no way. I'd rather live my life on welfare than that. Uh, there ain't no way I'm going to do that. Uh, but I like Wicked Tuna. You know, you like Wicked Tuna? Yeah, because they actually are fishing with a rod. and catch. I kind of like to feel what it's like to haul in one of them things that weighs like four or 500 pounds. I don't know. They'd probably pull me right over again. I'd be right back where I started from. I'd be like the modern-day version of Jonah. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I think that uh, this morning we're going to have a fish story. Uh, and uh, it's uh, found, uh, as uh, was read for us by Nick, Pastor Nick, in Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 5, and the first thing we're going to see again is that this begins with instruction. Uh, so point one is instruction in verses 1 to 3. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Okay, Gennesaret is another name for the Sea of Galilee, uh, which we said before was like 680 feet below sea level. It's the, one of the areas of the concentration of Jesus now in the area of Capernaum. And it says now it had happened. Uh, there's been some passage of time between the end of chapter 4 uh, and uh, now the beginning of uh, chapter 5. 
Uh, and so there's an indefinite period there. Uh, some say that the parallel accounts to this are found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22, and Mark 1, 16 to 20. Uh, others say that they are not parallel accounts, uh, and uh, I tend to go with that version because in the other, account, the other two accounts, which are parallel, it says that Jesus went to these men while they were fishing. Here it says they weren't fishing, uh, but they were cleaning and drying uh, their nets. Uh, and so I think that we have to keep in large part a lot of times that many of these disciples that followed Jesus, they followed him for a time, uh, or they would come and hear him, they go back to their work, and uh, with the, these disciples like Peter and James and John and Andrew, that it was a process, uh, that they had heard Jesus on several occasions, as we, heard, I think Pastor Jeff uh, dealt with a passage where uh, Jesus went to uh, Peter's uh, house or to his mother-in-law's house and, and healed her. And so they had been following him, but here you have their call to leave everything and become quote-unquote full-time uh, disciples where they would uh, leave their livelihood and follow him uh, everywhere. So they were, it says that Jesus was traveling and teaching, uh, and uh, they were cleaning and drying their nets to maintain them. Uh, if you have nets and they're filled with garbage and trash, I know enough about fishing to know that the fish aren't going to go in it, uh, and they'll avoid it. Uh, and also, if you uh, don't clean and dry your nets, that they, and you throw them on a pile somewhere, which is probably what I would do if I were a fisherman because I'm lazy, uh, they will rot. And, and so they're, uh, they are off, uh, they're cleaning their nets, and uh, Jesus is teaching. And I want you to see again, I know Jeff has picked up on it, I keep picking up on it, that the central core thing is that Jesus preached the word and he taught. Yes, there were healings. Yes, there were miracles. Yes, people came to see them. But the, uh, the uh, miracles really only confirmed his message and who he was. The central thing is always the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God. That's why we call ourselves the Berean Bible Church, because we preach and teach the Word of God. There's a great lie out there today uh, that uh, uh, no one wants to hear preaching. Uh, and yet here we see people who were so... Uh, desirous to hear from Jesus that they were pressing upon him. Now, none of us is ever going to preach like Jesus, are we? Because his, his preaching was perfect. But the preaching and teaching of the Word of God is central, very much neglected today, and very, very necessary. Because it's the preaching of the Word of God that stirs people's hearts, that meets their needs, and we know that there are many people today that are searching for truth and reality in their lives. And much of our unrest is today because people are not satisfied in their lives. But there are people out there, when they hear the word of God, there are people out there who recognize they don't have the truth. They're starving for the truth of God's word. And here it was that they're forcing themselves upon him. He says, because why? Because Jesus taught, remember, with great authority. And they said, we never heard anything like this before. But I'm here to tell you that there are people out there in the world today that we have access to that they've never really been taught the word of God. And they have this idea about church and about the Bible where it's like they've just written it off. You know, church is the worst thing in the world. You'd rather go to the dentist than sit through a service. That, uh, you know, the, the Bible's old and dusty and has nothing to say for today. And, you know, you will run into people, and probably you have if you witness a lot, that when you start to teach the Word of God, people get excited. They've never heard that. No one's ever taught them. Maybe they've sat in a church for years and years, but no one has taken the time to teach them the Word of God because many churches don't teach it anymore. And, and I can tell you it doesn't always have to be by preaching. We teach through skits and other things. But the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God is central. And it takes center stage. And it always will here. Even, even this week when we're teaching young people. You know, the center part. They're going to have fun. They're going to have games. They're going to have activities. But the center part of the evening is the teaching of the Word of God. And our Sunday school, our, our Bible club teachers, our Sunday school teachers, uh, our Bible club uh, people, our men and women's Bible study people, they center everything on the Word of God. Because without the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God, everything is vanity in life, isn't it? You're never going to accomplish anything without that. You know, and I, when I was thinking that, I thought of some, I looked up, uh, just looked at some of the great leaders, just a couple of them. 
uh, that the world has known. Men who reached the pinnacle of power. You remember, some of you already know the story of Alexander the Great. That is a young man. He conquered the then known world. And, and when he was done, he, he still wasn't satisfied. That he, we were told that he sat and he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. The pinnacle of power. Everybody fell his knees. And because there was nothing else to do and he recognized there was nowhere to go, his life fell into debauchery and he died. Some say sickness. Most now believe that he was poisoned uh, by some of his underlings. Hannibal, the great general, has said that he filled three baskets with golden rings from those that he had overcome and slaughtered. He committed suicide by taking poison because he had no meaning in his life and he was miserable and they said that when he died nobody mourned his passing Julius Caesar we all know the story of Julius Caesar do you know though that he is believed to have been responsible in the leading of his armies for the deaths of a million people and that he conquered 800 cities and of course we know what became of him he went back to his homeland, to his friends, and they assassinated him. Napoleon, the feared conqueror, known as the scourge of Europe, spent his last years in exile, exiled by his own people. You see, because that's what it is. If people are, are left well, without the Word of God, if they're not taught the Word of God, if they don't have a centering in Christ, then everything in their life at the end of the day is vanity. Suicide is rampant in our society because of that. In the richest country in the world, with the greatest technology and the greatest blessings that you could have, and especially right now we know that suicides, drug addiction, it's gone through the roof. Why? Because people think that all of life is vanity because they have not learned from the Word of God. They have not taken it and applied it to their life. Because here's where you'll find satisfaction. God's truth is what brings power into people's life, what brings contentment into their life, what brings victory into their life. And I guess we ask ourselves again this morning, are you hungering uh, for fellowship with God, are you hungering for His presence and for His Word? Second Timothy, chapter four. You see, when when Paul is dealing with with uh, Timothy, he doesn't talk to him about, hey, what you need to do if you really want to get a following is you need to go out and you need to be a miracle worker. What do you say to him? Paul said to Timothy in chapter four, verse one, I charge you in the presence of God. Of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths which are, I add to that, vanity that isn't a, a passage just for preachers that's a passage for all of us yes it was said to the young man Timothy but for all of us we can t cause a stir look at the stir that Jesus called in Galilee who Josephus says at this time there are about three million people in Galilee and everybody heard of him and people came pressing upon him starving for the truth so much so that he's walking along the shore and it's almost like pushing him into the water. And so there, you know that if you've been with me long, how much I despise the seashore, right? This is my proof text. Jesus didn't like it. He didn't want to get in it. He didn't want to be pushed to the edge of it. So there. You know I'm kidding, right? But people knew when they hear the word truthfully and completely, it has power. And it's different. And they knew that Jesus was different because he spoke with authority. Here's where the satisfaction would lie for these people. But, you know, sometimes we get distracted by that. Because I think that the, the, the disciples here, 
that Peter and, and, and James and John, they, they already knew of Jesus. They weren't into a full-time commitment yet. But while Jesus is preaching, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're business. They're busy. They're cleaning their nets. They're drying their nets. And here's Jesus being impressed by these other people. You know, we get so tied up in the Word and our business and thing. You know, we get so tied up that we don't have time for the Word. It becomes secondary to our life. But there are always people who are seeking the truth. And they're pressing upon Jesus. And if you've ever been in public speaking or do anything, you know, there, there's a reason why I'm a little off from you anyway. First of all, I tend to spit on you, and this is not a good time for that. But secondly... It's hard to speak when, they're, when you're being pressed and jostled and, and the people are this close to you. So Jesus comes up with this wonderful idea to go out into the boat. And by the way, the acoustics along the water's edge are good, aren't they? Acoustics over water are wonderful. You can speak to a large, large crowd if you speak uh, across uh, water here. And of course, in this account, I want you to take note that uh, though it's uh, to more than just Peter, the focus is upon him. And though they're tied up in their business, these fishermen will soon be caught in the master's net. This is going to be a watershed moment in their lives, and in Peter's life in particular. Yes, they already knew of Jesus. Yes, they had seen him do wonderful things. But now it's time for the Lord to be much more in their life, to move into their life more intensely. Yes, they had been exposed to him before. But now they're going to embark on the rest of his earthly ministry with him. And for the next three and a half years or three years, whatever is left of this now, they're going to be learning of Jesus as the Messiah, as Jesus as God. And that's going to take all their time to try to get that. And they still, when he goes, are going to struggle with some things until he comes back again, until he's resurrected. But I just want you to know that it always begins with Christ and always begins with us with the teaching of the Word and teaching with authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. We still have that available to us. No, we'll never, we'll never preach the way Christ did. You imagine sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing a message, never made one mistake, Never said one thing that was wrong. I can't even begin to uh, come close to that. Except that through the power of the Spirit, any one of us can be a preacher. And we're all called to preach at times. Maybe not from a pulpit, but we're all called to preach to those at our workplace to, and to teach those who we come into contact with, our friends, our family, our neighbors. What a privilege to handle the Word of God to share it, to be witnesses for Christ. And I think it's important that we no notice that Jesus used anything he, he, that was available as his pulpit. Here he preaches from a boat. We know he also preaches from the mountains. He preaches in the desert. He preaches in a house. He even preaches in a cemetery, doesn't he? Did he preach in a cemetery? Yes, Lazarus, right? Anything can be our pulpit, and every pulpit is a fishing boat because we're there to win people to Christ. And so the first thing you have to note here is, you know, because we're so drawn to miracles, we want to focus on the miracles in this passage. But ever and always see as we go through these scriptures, we go through the Gospels, that's always saying Jesus is teaching. Jesus is preaching. Because that's the first thing he does. That's the central thing that he does. Now here, he gets to do demonstration. Now we can demonstrate. We preach and then we demonstrate the truths of God's worth in our life. We live it out. We're not miracle workers the way Jesus was, but Jesus is here in his ministry, and now he not only uh, instructs, he demonstrates. We pick it up in verse 4. And when he had finished, when Jesus had finished speaking... He said to Simon, put out, your, uh, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats 
so that they began to sink. Now that's quite a fishing trip, isn't it? But I look at the demonstration and say, well, this is a really curious command. Jesus gets done preaching and he says, let's go fishing. Now for those of us who like to fish, there's never a bad time really to fish, is there? Fishing's, you know, a fun thing. But can you imagine now, here is Peter, and he's a professional fisherman, and Jesus, he said, was a carpenter. What does he know about fishing? He says, let's go fishing. Cast out into the deep. Now, as I said, I'm not a bit, I don't know anything about fishing in the ocean, but I do know about trout fishing. I did a lot of it. I did tons of it when I was a kid. And I can imagine someone coming and trying to tell me how to trout fish. It's like Pastor Nick. Pastor Nick's gotten into fishing re recently. And, and we go up to my cabin sometimes once a year, and they go fishing and stuff. And, and if Pastor Nick tried to tell me how to fish today, I'd be like, are you kidding me? When I met Pastor Nick, he didn't know which end of the line went into the water. I said, don't tell me how to fish. And what everything that Jesus is saying here really goes against fishing etiquette. You see, because when they fish, what did he say? We fished last night. Because especially with the nets and the means that they had that day, they used two boats, they put the nets between them, and they generally fished at night. Because what happens with fish, I know this is, this is true of all fish, at night they become active and they come into the shallows to feed. And so they would fish in the shallows, not in the deep. And they would fish at night, not in the day generally. And so this goes against all etiquette. It's the wrong time of the day. It's the wrong place. We already know it wasn't a good day for fishing. Fishing is one of those things where they say, hey, the bite's on or the bite's not on. It seems like when one fish is eaten, they're all eaten. And when, 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 when one's not, none of them are. And so here they are at a dock. And I know one thing about fishing. If you're a fisherman, you've got secret spots. No, but don't tell people your secret spots. And here they are right by the dock. And Jesus says, cast out of deep. Just go right out here into the deep and let down, your, let down your nets. Are you kidding me? Wrong time, wrong place. Not a good thing to do. It's amazing how Jesus uses everyday business to teach us eternal truths. And I think the first thing you see here is his ability, doesn't it? You know, Jesus is about to turn their world upside down. Because although he wasn't a fisherman by trade, he had something they didn't know about. He had supernatural sonic sight. And I don't think he created the fish here. I think he just called them together. Isn't that something? They just called them into this place where they wouldn't normally be. Because you don't fish at the dock. Everybody fished at the dock. The fish are all gone from the dock a long time ago you got to go to your secret spot that nobody else knows. Don't tell anybody where I took you fishing. Because why? They'll all come and catch them and take them. Fishermen by nature are greedy. Unless you fish like me, though. If it ain't some Mr. Paul's, I throw it back. Not only don't I like the, the sea, I don't like stuff that comes from the sea. I catch them and release them. You say, why you do it? They're fun to catch. But... I'm thinking of how Peter and those other fishermen you must have felt, you know. And yet they obey. They do it instantly because he says to them, go, put out. Put out your boat. That's an aorist imperative in the Greek. It means do it now, do it immediately. And he said, then I want you, and he goes from a singular to Peter to a plural. He said, let down your nets. Because it takes more than one. Day. All you fishermen got to go and do this. And they would have had every kind of uh, excuse in the world. I also like the Greek word order here. In English, we have it uh, translated, Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. But in the Greek, the sentence order is reversed. It starts out with, at your word, 
we will let down our nets. But, so the obedience comes first. Even before the objection of, you know, this really isn't the way you, you do things. But Peter's willing to do it. Why? Because the master has asked. He's willing to go boldly, unflinchingly, decidedly, without confidence in himself and his own abilities. Even though the excuses abound. You know, it's, it's not good. This is the wrong place. This is the wrong time. Our nets are already cleaned. I'm too tired. We were just out all night long. You know, how about tonight would be better? Uh, tomorrow would even be better yet. Did you ever think, you ever know those things that God's calling you to and you got all the excuses not to do? And they're wonderful excuses. They're actually legitimate excuses. And you, can you imagine, I, I always try to think of, of the miracles uh, of the great things that I could have seen if I would have been obedient, if I wouldn't have been rebellious, if I wouldn't have made excuses, if I wouldn't have just been so doggone lazy. Christians never get lazy, do you? You never come up with excuses not to serve the Lord. You never come up with excuses not to be involved. You never say you're too busy. You never say you're too tired. Man, that's one of my favorite phrases. Ask my kids. Dad, too, too tired. Yeah, but I'm too tired. Go see your mother. <laughs> She's not tired. They had fished all night and didn't catch anything. You got to ask, why? Was it because of lack of work? No, that fishing's hard work. Was it because of lack of expertise? No. They toiled all night. Why? Because what's going to make it different now is that the Lord's going to be with them. See, we can toil and labor if we don't have the Lord with us and we're not walking with the Lord and we're not under the instruction of the Lord and the direction of the Lord. We might not accomplish anything at all. Didn't Jesus say that? Without me, you can accomplish what? Nothing. But here, Peter's willing, with all of his business expertise, with all the things that he knows about, all the things that raise doubt, all the whispers that had to be gone through his mind, you really don't want to do this. He boldly steps out in faith. We know who Jesus is, don't we? We know the miraculous things we've done, and so did Peter. And if indeed it's true that he'd already been to his mother-in-law's house, which I think it's true, he'd seen what he'd done there. But he'd never seen him do anything with fishing. But I know one of the things that I've learned about the Lord is when you trust him in one thing, then you grow in your faith, then he gives another and another and another. This is part of their growing. And that faith conquers doubt. And that faith brings us victory in our lives. And that's what happened here. Because our Lord rewards our faith. He says if we labor patiently, we'll reap in due season, won't we? That's a promise. He led to the Galatians. My memory serves me right. The faith conquered his doubts. And what? They were rewarded, weren't they? A bounty too much to hold. Obedience yields blessing. Those are the spiritual truths in these everyday encounters here. And you know what I find really amazing to me is that in all of this, in all of what God wants to do, in all of the instruction that he wants us to be, he gives us the opportunity to witness to people, to, to be his servants, that he uses us. That human agency is important. Yes, there was a miracle here, but didn't the Lord Jesus use fishermen? Didn't he use their boats? Didn't he use their nets? He didn't have to. If he can call fish into the deep, he'd say, well, you know, I can get them here, but he could have called them right in, right into the boat in the shallows, right at the dock. 
He could have had fish stick their faces up out of the water. You know how fish go when they're out of water? Yeah. Peter, hold me in. He could have had them fish swim up to the shore and jump right on. Matter of fact, in John chapter 21, he basically does because he tells them where to cast, but when they get there, he's already got fish on the coals right when he's resurrected. Remember that? Jesus loves to show these fishermen how to fish. By the way, Peter and John and them, after the resurrection, they got their eyes off of what their mission was, didn't they? They went back to fishing. And then Jesus is walking along the shore again. Hey, you catching any fish? Not a thing. He says, cast on the other side of the boat. Right? Remember? And then they had so many that they couldn't haul them in. And someone gets the great idea to say to Peter, it was John, I guess, said, it's the Lord. And he jumps in and swims back to shore, and Jesus has a fire there with coals and fish on him already. It's amazing that God wants to use us. He loves us. Just as he loved Peter, just as he loved his disciples, he loves us. And he uses us. As undeserving of we, that, that we are of that. And we're going to see that in just a moment. See, we lose the wonder of the Word of God a lot of times. We handle it so often that it becomes blasé to us. It becomes second nature. We think, oh, there might be a better way than this. There's no better way. There's nothing more wonderful than sharing the Word of God with others, than studying it yourself, than sitting at the feet of the Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, learning for ourselves and sharing it with others. And here we have a demonstration. We don't have a miracle. I don't know that we could go down here to the Schuylkill River and throw a net in and bring in tons of fish and say, see, God has done that for you. But we see it demonstrated in our lives, the power of his word each and every day, don't we? And now with these men, after the demonstration, he gives them an, invita an invitation. Excuse me. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now the first thing that Peter his first reaction to that, of course, first, they were completely amazed. They were astonished. And then Peter realizes how unworthy he is. And this is important for all of us to realize as we serve the Lord. Simon Peter knows that he's a sinner. He knows that he's not worthy to experience the benefits of God's power and presence. He knows that if Jesus can see into the depths of the sea, he can also see Peter's depraved heart. It's an attitude that is important for us to have, that we don't deserve to handle his word, we don't deserve to be his children, we don't deserve anything at his hands. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22. In the ESV it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Now if you're like me as an older guy, we were all raised in the King James Version, right? Right? I like the way the King James does this. And when you deal with this kind of issue of our unworthiness, it probably is difficult to translate a lot of these uh, verses. But in the King James, Lamentations 3.22 says this, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. What a privilege. And, and Peter was right to be humble. And Peter looks at himself uh, as many uh, of the great men of the Scripture did and women of the Scripture and people of Scripture who recognize that God was with him. And he says, go away. Go away. 
Isaiah says, a man of unclean lips. Uh, John says in Revelation chapter 1, when I saw him, when I saw the Lord, I fell at his feet as though dead. He's basically saying, I, I passed out. I was overcome. Luke chapter 18. And I love this attitude of this tax collector here in Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells this story. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, one a religious leader, one who thought he had it all going on, and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man, who the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, God can use people who are humble. God can use people who recognize that they're not worthy. That's what Peter's saying. Go away. I'm not worthy. And I thank God that Jesus didn't answer that request. Sometimes your prayers don't get answered. That's a good one that didn't get answered, isn't it? Why? Because Peter had the right mindset. There was no presumption that God owes him anything. And I see a lot of people today that are upset. How could God let this happen to me? Why would God? I'm his child. Don't ever presume upon God. God doesn't owe you anything. And some of you remember my father. I knew my father was on the board here. And my dad wasn't the most spiritual man in the world, but he taught me a lot about Scripture without a day of Bible college. And probably one of the, the greatest things, probably the greatest thing he taught me because he taught it to me over and over. We were out in the woods hunting, we were doing other things, that we'd sit around and talk, and over and over he'd say, you know what, Jace, God doesn't owe me anything. I owe him everything. He said, remember that in your life. God doesn't owe you a thing. We owe him everything. If you get that down, you're on the road to being a real follower of Christ. Someone who the Lord can use. Someone who, like, can say, you know, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where we both can get bread. God loves us, but he doesn't owe us. It's only out of his love and his mercy and his compassions that we have everything. And now he makes this choice, you know, where we say, you know, he says, don't be afraid. Jesus, don't be afraid. Don't be, fear, well, don't be afraid you're not good enough. Don't be afraid you're not smart enough. Don't be afraid I'm going to take you from what you're doing now and make you a fisher of men. A lot of us don't witness. A lot of us don't uh, want to share God's word because we don't think we know enough. Because we don't think we're versed enough in the scriptures. Because we're sinners. But God delights to take people, even sinners, and make them his servants and give them the opportunity to serve him. And we all have abilities. And we all have spiritual gifts if you're saved. Many of you will never preach from a pulpit like this. And maybe some of you think I shouldn't be. I'm as shocked of any of you that I ever stood up here in front of people. When I went to Bible college, that's why I said, what do you want to do when you're here in Bible college? What do you want to study? I said, I don't know. I think maybe missionary. They said, why don't you get in the pastoral department? Then you can decide later on. I said, that's the one thing I'm not going to be. Why not? How do you know God's not going to be a pastor? I said, because I can't speak. I'm not a speaker. It's not what I do. And go ahead. Somebody say, well, there you had it right in the beginning. 
But the more I went, and the more I went to the classes, and the more I came to the thing, you know, the head of the department comes and says, guess what, son? What? He said, you're a preacher. Came here and served under Pastor Didden. And his wife said, guess what? You're a preacher. Guess what? For better or worse, I'm a preacher. But I don't deserve to be here. It humbles me every time I have an opportunity that God calls to follow. And we're all called to preach, at least to some extent. Maybe not from up here, but we're all called to witness. And we're all called to share God's word. And we're all called to live it out. And we all have abilities. You know, this was a curious choice. To me, he picks these uneducated fishermen. But there's good qualities of fishermen. First of all, they're daring and courageous, right? If you haven't watched Deadly Catch, go ahead. They'd go out in the Bering Sea. You would, uh, no way, I'd be hanging on to the pier. I could hold that whole boat back. There ain't no way I'm going out in that. Fishermen are patient. They're determined. It's hard work. And imagine they did it without any kind of hydraulics or anything like that, just by sheer brute force. They hauled those nets, and they pulled those things in, and they cast them again. And fishermen have faith. They always think they're going to catch the big one. And in order to do whatever they did, they had to work together. But now God's going to take these men from what they knew and give them a new occupation. Now, I, if I was sitting there, I'd say, this is, just, this, is just, this is the story of J. Serb. Peter just has had the very best night he's ever had fishing in his life. His business just went through the roof, and he says, okay, Peter, great night of fishing. He says, yeah, I quit. Why? Because the one I call master, I now call Lord. Look at it, verse 5, verses, verse 8. Is it 5 and 8? Yeah. He recognizes, and he's moving along. He's recognizing the deity of Christ. And sometimes we get those things backward. A lot of us would think if we had a great day in business, that would mean God wants us to continue in business. And so most of us will. And I want you to say that the preaching is left up to those who are quote-unquote full-time services. We're all full-time Christians. And we're all called to preach and to teach. And we need to understand and recognize and stand against Satan and his lies and those people who might tear us down to say that Jesus transforms everyday people, even sinful people, into his servants. And he says to Peter, you don't have to fear. You're going to be a fisher of men, of mankind. And the Greek word here is interesting, so you're going to catch men. Because when you're a fisherman, you catch fish that are alive and you kill them. But he had the full translation of this Greek word. He said, I'm going to make you a fisherman. You're going to catch men. You're going to catch men alive. And the greatest thing about preaching the gospel is that you take people who are dead in trespasses and sin, you show them the truth, you show them where you have gotten life, and that's where they get life as well. Spiritual life, eternal life, available to each and every one of us. How'd it go for Peter? Well, he had some rough roads in the transition, but he went from catching fish to catching men. In Acts chapter 2, it says he preached, and 3,000 people got saved. In Acts chapter 4, Four, he preached, and 5,000 people got saved. God so empowers his people, he says, you're going to do even greater things than I did. In the sense of results, you know, when Jesus went to the cross, how many people were standing by him? Nobody. And of course, that was a fulfillment of scripture, too. I'll spite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But he said to the disciples, if you follow after me, you will do great and wondrous things. I never preached and won 3,000 to Christ or 5,000. But every one or two or three and every single one that you lead to Christ 
are witness for for Christ, even if they don't come to Christ, you shared the truth with them, God will reward you for that. You're a faithful servant. How can we have this great truth and not share it with others? That is our number one occupation. It's the number one occupation of us all to witness for Christ through our behavior, through our attitude, through our words. And I'm not more spiritual, and Jeff's not more spiritual, and Nick's not more spiritual than any of you because we're full-time. Bill Pfeiffer, who was the founding chairman here and was a chairman for many years. Bill Pfeiffer, who was one of my heroes. He's with the Lord now. Many of you know him. Worked at Jones Motor Freight for 50 years. Was one of their best employees ever. And he preached every day. What a godly example. And he volunteered here. And he held the board and he did Bible studies and as far as Christian businessmen. You see, as pastors, we, we get paid. And there's always that battle. Am I doing this for my love of the Lord or because I'm getting paid? I hope if I ever do it for the paycheck, you ought to be able to see that and get rid of me. I knew that Bill Piper did it because of his love of the Lord. And he was a servant of the Most High God. I know that many of you are doing that now, and others need to be encouraged and not faint because our nation and the world is being plunged into darkness. They're in despair. They're chasing after vanity. And there are a good number of them if we just get them to sit and listen and pray that the Holy Spirit would open their hearts and their minds, they would get excited about the Word of God. Don't be despaired because this is, these are the last days, which they certainly are. But there's a multitude of fish to be caught. And you have the opportunity that sometimes we don't have as pastors we're surrounded by Christians just about all day long, right? Aren't we, Jeff? We have a little question about our church secretary, but other than that, <laughs> I don't think she's here, is she? Don't tell Sue I said that. That's funny. See, I'll tell you something about fishing. If you want to catch fish, you go where the fish are. If you want to catch people, you go where the people are. And God has people everywhere in every vocation, in every activity. God's people are there, and we're there to be salt and light, aren't we? We're there to be witnesses for Christ. And we need to take up that mantle now more than ever. The times are short. And I hope you leave here, if you know Christ is your Savior, excited if you're listening online that you get excited about serving the lord if you don't know who the lord is and you feel like you're like you're a fish that's like i don't know what is going on come and see me talk to pastor jeff call us talk to a person who knows christ is their savior if they don't know the answers in scripture tell them the, well then find it out for me because i can tell you the principles of scripture will deal with you wherever you are in your life. Amen? And so, do we not all want to be fishermen for Christ? Our Heavenly Father, we live in the midst of a darkened world, and all of us know so many people. We know far more people who don't know Christ than know Him. And so, the mission field is right there in front of us. The opportunities are there daily. We ask that you would help us, you know, bring us into those situations where we can be fishers of men and help us to seize those opportunities and to toil tirelessly for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Make us bold, Father, to cast out into the deep and to be effective as your witnesses. We pray, Father, that you would use us, strengthen us, help us to learn by first of all sitting at your feet that we might be effective when others sit at ours. And Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for life, for life everlasting, and for the opportunity to share it with all that we come into contact. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. They always describe those who go into ministry that they were called, but I argue that all of us are called, and we see that in today's passage. So would you please stand as we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back, no none go with. Father, we thank you for your message, your gospel. That is for the unbelieving and the believing. To the unbelieving, may they today know in their hearts that you are calling them to not fight it any longer, but to give up their nets, forsake it all, and to follow you, whatever that may mean, to believe in you for salvation. And for the rest who are already believing, may we every day recognize our need to follow you. We may say at certain times that we desire to follow you and we give it all up, but through temptation and sin in the world, we go back to our old ways. But we thank you that, I thank you that I know who I'm believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, meaning you, our Savior God. You saved us once for all, and once for always. But even in that walk, we may stray. So give us the grace to continually follow after you for those mercies that are new every day. We have decided to follow Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.